the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobray. I want you to just take them in your hands. Oh, stand. Sorry. In our generation, there's going to be more and more skepticism about this book. What makes this book believable? What makes this book any different than any other book? The Quran, the Book of Mormon, all of these other religious books. But you see, this book isn't just any book. This book is the Word of God. It's been proved. It's come through 66 66 books, 30 plus authors. They didn't know each other and they all wrote the same thing. And from Genesis to Revelation, there is a theme and there is a scarlet cord. And this is the story of Jesus and humanity. And it's a word of God. It's the word of the Lord. And God speaks those things that are not as if they were. God is the God of faith. He requires his people to have faith. And so it's going to be difficult at times to believe the word of God when your flesh and everything else in this world tells you it's not true. But the victorious believer and those that will last 35 years and have something to tell about it and those that will last 50 years and like my folks, they're 67 years of marriage. Those will be the ones that listened to this book, did what it said to do and believed it. Because Jesus is the living word and God says all scripture is given by inspiration of God, by the breath of God, the Holy Spirit. It's profitable for instruction, for correction, for rebuke, that the man and the woman of God would be perfect and completely fit and mature so that they can handle anything and everything that comes their way and they can grow up into maturity and that's the plan of God. But it's going to take the word of God to do it. So tonight, and as this marriage series has gone on, God has a lot to say about his plan, marriage. And it may not be what the world says. It's definitely not what your friends are going to say or what your families may have said and taught you. But it's what God says. He made us. He invented this. This is his system. This is his plan. And this is where we get the information. And everything Jim and I have taught comes right out of this book. And as two crazy kids that were both failures, I'm coming out of a drug, a drug culture and he's coming out of three divorces. We were a mess. We went to a faith convention on our honeymoon, and we've been running with God ever since. And I can tell you that this is true, and it works. So if you've got your Bible, just hold it up before the Lord tonight. This is your sword. This is the word of God to you. This is the letter of God to you. This is God speaking to you and to me. So, Father, we thank you for the word of God that you have not left us alone and you've not left us as orphans, but Lord, you've given us the Holy Spirit as our teacher and you've given us your word to point the way and to show us what to do and how to do it, to give us insight into every life situation. And tonight, Lord, as we open the word, I pray that you'd open our hearts. As we look at the last commandment for women, Father, that you have for marriage, I pray for the women of this house that they would be mighty daughters of God, They would be strong in the Lord and in the power of your might. That they'd be women of courage and faith. That no weapon that would ever, ever be formed against them would ever prosper in their life as they stand and hold up the shield of faith and the sword of the Spirit. And may your daughters be warriors in your kingdom. May their shields shine in the face of your anointing. May their blades glisten in the sun. And I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. And that was a quote out of Psalm chapter 84. Behold our shields as they glisten under the anointing of God, our swords. We are warriors in the kingdom of God. And Jim and I started this marriage series, and I, and I, my part, there's four commandments for the women, and there's eight for the men. There's twice as many for the men. And that is because women are a little bit more complicated, and you've got to work just a little bit harder with us. That was a joke. You are not laughing. But can I tell you a joke? You want to hear one? I want to have fun tonight, okay? You're all looking at me a little bit sour. So smile. Let me see your pretty teeth. Okay, here we go. This is about Grandpa Jones, which is becoming very dear to me, Grandpa Jones, because I have a Grandpa Cobra. 
Grandpa Jones was celebrating his 100th birthday and everybody complimented him on how athletic and well-preserved he appeared. Gentlemen, I will tell you the secret of my success. He cackled. I have been in the open air day after day for some 75 years now. The celebrants were impressed and asked how he managed to keep up his rigorous fitness regime. Well, you see, my wife and I were married 75 years ago. On our wedding night, we made a solemn pledge. Whenever we had a fight, the one who was proved wrong would go outside and take a walk. Okay, for those of you that are a little delayed, <laughs> Ephesians chapter 4, chapter 5. You know, remember, I'm the one that doesn't tell jokes very well, so you have to humor me and make me feel good. Grandpa Jones, you know, he was taking a walk because he was always wrong. But that's the joke. <laughs> Did you get it now? Okay, well. Just don't want to play, do you? Just want to sit there and just be sour pusses. <laughs> no, I'm going to give you one more. <laughs> Attending a wedding for the first time, a little girl whispered to her mother, why is the bride dressed in white? Because white is the color of happiness and today is the happiest day of her life. <gasps> the child thought about this for a moment and she said, so then why is the groom wearing black? Okay, Ephesians chapter 5. We started this out, and God said that marriage is a, is a metaphor, it's a typology, it's a picture, it's a word picture, like Jim preached this morning, if you weren't here, it was an amazing word, that we are living epistles read of all men. St. Francis of Assisi said, centuries ago, preach the gospel at all costs and at all times, and if necessary, open your mouth. The point is that our words don't speak as loud as our lives. And God told us that marriage is a picture of Jesus and the church. So when they look at a Christian marriage, the world that doesn't know him, they ought to be seeing a picture of the Lord and the church. An incredible love story and a beautiful romance because God is the ultimate romantic. He invented love, he is love, and he is the divine romancer. There is no doubt about it. And so Paul's writing to the book, writing the book of Ephesians, and he's talking about marriage, and he's talking about it in Ephesians chapter 5. So let's just quickly read it, and then we'll go into it. In chapter 5, verse 21, it says, Submitting to one another in the fear of the Lord. We start there because we do submit one to another. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is head of the wife, as also Christ is head of the church. He's the Savior of the body. Therefore... Just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So we saw that women were to submit to their own husbands. That was commandment number one. That they were to let their husbands be the ruler, and they were to, to come under the authority of the husband. And that's totally foreign to a generation that has been raised up in a liberation movement. And I said that submission is freedom and rebellion is bondage. And it's a long, it's a long wonderful teaching. It's one of the best teachings I've ever done on submission. And I, I, I recommend that you get it. God didn't say women submit to every man. But there is a delegated authority in the kingdom of God because he's a God of authority. And God said, that you are to submit to your own husband. And Jim is the head of our house and I'm to come under. And the word submit comes from a transliteration of the Latin, submissio, which means sub, under, and messio which means mission. It means to come under the mission of another. And the, and the wife is to be that help me, that easier can ego, that great strength and ally that the man needs. And she surrounds him with aid and assistance. And she comes under the mission of the man. And that's her God-given role. Men were not made for women. Women were made for men. Out of the very side of Adam, out of the same DNA and the same substance, God brought forth Eve. And it was a beautiful and an incredible romantic love story. And God says, women, I need you to understand I'm a God of authority. Come under the authority of your husband. Then the next commandment was, let's go on and read it. Because I'm just going to review this as we read through it. And then we'll get to number four. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Let the husband be the head of the house. 
Satan knows what an incredible influence the woman is to the man. He's the head, but we're the neck that turns the head. When Satan came to tempt Adam and Eve, he did not go to Adam first, he went to the woman. Why? Because he knew that she would have tremendous influence over Adam. And the whole point of this, women, is that we're far more powerful than we realize. Now, your husband's not going to tell you this, and the men are not going to tell us this. But they're the heads, but we turn that head. And God says, let them be the head of the house. Don't manipulate. We looked at Jezebel and some others, and because you can. There's no, there's no doubt that women can be forceful and women can be all these things, but God says, I don't want you to be like the world. There's another power that's working in the kingdom that you don't understand. It's the power of meekness. And meekness is power under the control of love. And come and learn what a meek and a quiet spirit is. And just as Jesus went to the cross as the Lamb of God, and that Lamb swallowed up that dragon and took out Satan by looking like he failed, when women begin to understand that my power isn't in the force of the flesh, but it's in the power power of the spirit and the love of God that then I can be a great influence to my man and my family and so I'm to let him be the head of the house and to pull out in him all the hero that God's put in there because they're sons of God women the third commandment as we keep reading therefore just as the church is subject to Christ so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything husbands love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her and here comes the commandments now for the men God says, men, you're to love this woman like I love the church. Agape her. Sacrifice for her. That he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of the water by the word. That he might present her to himself a glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. And Jim's been covering the tremendous commandments for the men. I mean, it's not, this is not a jockeying for position. This is not a, a war. This is not a race. This is a journey of love through life together. And it's not, he's right, I'm wrong, I'm right, he's wrong. It is a coming together of oneness and unity like the Godhead. You're not going to see Jesus and the Father having a fight. You're not going to see Jesus and the Holy Spirit at odds with each other. And we are carnal. We're still in the flesh. We don't know what the Spirit of God is like and what the kingdom is like. And God is saying marriage is actually going to teach you about the kingdom of God. That I've taken you out of this kingdom of darkness where everything fell. And I brought you to this new kingdom. And in this new kingdom, you are going to learn how to what? You're going to learn how to be really human. What you're supposed to be like. Magnificent sons and magnificent daughters. Having marriages that are heaven on earth. And revealing what it is to be Christians. And what it is to have Christ and the church loving each other. Now that may seem like that's an impossibility. But it's not. It's God's plan. But for that to happen in our lives and be successful. We're going to have to come under submission to the word of God. Because if I do things God's way, I'll be successful. But if I do things my way, I'm going to fail. Because the arm of the flesh, the old nature, the old ways will never access and bring the power of God. It never will. It can't. So this is a spirit thing that manifests into our physical lives and our families. So we read on. So she's to submit to her husband as unto the Lord. She's to allow him to be head of the house. In verse 28 and 30, it says, For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Jim taught on that last week, that God tells the man to leave his mother and his father, that he's forming a new union, a new family. It's not that we don't honor our family traditions or our people or our families where we came from, but they don't rule us. The husband's the head, the wife is next to him like the Godhead, and you are bringing up your own families. And so a husband is to forsake his mother and his father, and he's to cleave to his wife. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the husband see and respect her husband. So commandment number three is reverence. And it was an amazing thing to learn that the psyche of a man and how God has programmed a man and how God has formed and fashioned man in his image. He's formed and fashioned woman and women crave love. But men crave reverence, respect. And respect to a man is equivalent to love for a woman. And when my man, boy, if I have the wrong tone or the wrong attitude, let me tell you, I do not have a happy husband. 
and they're wired that way they're made that way and so God tells us what is respect and we looked at second Peter first Peter chapter 3 that that reverence respect is actually a power force in the kingdom of God and when we begin to be good at it when we begin to understand it when we begin to step into it we adore our husbands esteem them prize them be devoted to them deeply love and enjoy our husbands that all kinds of things are happening and activating in that relationship you can be married to the worst of the worst right now and it says if your husbands aren't obeying the word of god wives they'll be one not by your words they're not going to listen to us but they'll be one by your reverence there's a power force of reverence when it begins to step into a family and it begins to bring godly order and men rise to the occasion of the hero that's on the inside of them and reverence actually pulls that out now I'm dealing with the women because my job is to teach the woman's commandments Jim's been dealing with the men and there's eight of the men and there's four of the women now tonight number four we're gonna go out of Ephesians chapter 5 and we're gonna go to Titus because I believe out of all the things that I could say Titus probably says it the best I believe that Jim will be stepping out of Hebrew or Ephesians 5 for one more commandment also on the cleaving but this is commandment number four that God has taught me and in Titus chapter 2 it says very clearly in verse 3 let the older women likewise well let's go to chapter 2 verse 1 I'll just read it quickly but as for you speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine the word doctrine is the word for teaching that the older men be sober serious sound minds reverent temperate sound in faith and loving and patience the older women likewise that they be reverent in behavior not slanderers not given to much wine teachers of good things that they admonish the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be discreet, chaste, keepers at home. I'm reading out of the old King James now. Good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Let's read that again. Can I have it, um, Titus chapter 2, can I have verse 4? The aged women likewise. Now I like this because I did a little, a little word study. This The aged women means old. That's what it means. So I qualify now. I'm 63. I'm an old woman. I am the one that's supposed to teach this. I'm one of them. There's many wonderful teachers in this church. But because I'm married 35 years and we've walked through some things, God says, now you can't drink much wine. We took a vow when we were married because we were both a little bit drunk. I was a druggie and he was a drunk. We, we, we avowed never to touch alcohol and we haven't. We didn't know we were going to be pastors. But can you imagine if we drank? We'd all be at the South Side Saloon, you know? We had no idea, but we knew it wasn't healthy for us. We knew that we needed a sound mind and that alcohol for us was just something we just decided not to do. So we haven't had alcohol for 35 years, but this word says, don't let her drink much wine. So if you're drinking, it's not illegal, just not much, but let these older women and the word for older is presbutus which is where we get the word presbyter. It means old, aged, been around the block, knows what the neighborhood looks like. And God says, let her, be, let her be teachers of good things, that they admonish the young women to be sober. That doesn't mean sober like no drinking. That means sound mind. It means don't go crazy on your husband. Keep the word in your heart and in your mind love their husbands and this word love is not agape it's a greek word for fondness and affection god says i need you to be affectionate and be fond of your family love your husband love your children keep going to be discreet that means wise chaste that means modest keepers at home good obedient to their own husbands that the word of god be not blasphemed once again, a picture of our marriage, it can make God look good or it can make God look bad. And so I took all of that and the Holy Spirit taught me something. He said, I want you to make the fourth commandment for the woman that she is to be the keeper of the home. She's to be the keeper of the home. Now the man is the head of the house, but the woman is the heart of the home. And the word keeper there in the Greek means to stand guard and to watch over. 
And it's really quite an amazing thing. This is probably one of my most favorite things to look at. Because for so many years, as I grew up in the, in the 60s, in the, in the rebellious generation that burned our bras in college, the women's lib movement, and we have equal rights with men. And yes, you know, in the garden, they were equal. There's no doubt about it. But you see, that's a flesh thing. Because God, once again, is not getting the body of Christ to jockey for positions. This is about unity and oneness and staying in our roles, our spots where God's called us. There are some women that are called to lead and there is delegated authority and there's different authority. There's domestic authority, there's civil authority, there's spiritual authority. There's all kinds of authorities like Deborah in the Old Testament was a prophetess and a judge and she was a ruler. So women can lead. But in the home where there is domestic authority, the man is the head of the house. Are you with me? And growing up in this rebellious generation, we knew and we left our homes and we left the home. And so I've studied men and women and I've studied our biology and how God's made us. And I want to talk to you just a little bit about our differences tonight. Because we are wired differently as men and women. Now I've taught this many times and so for this, for many of you this isn't new, but it's one of the best examples I've ever heard of and it was, it was written by two pastors in Wisconsin and they wrote a book. Men are like waffles and women are like spaghetti. So if I could just have the picture of waffles and spaghettis up there. A waffle, do you see the, the, the squares in a waffle? Do you see that? Let's call those compartments. Let's look at spaghetti. Do you see that everything's touching everything? Women are like spaghetti. Can I get that picture back? Everything touches everything in a woman's brain and in her psyche. She's the relational piece. She's the one that wants to talk out the problems. Men want to work them out or walk them out. Woman wants to sit down and talk it out. Can I get a witness in the house with the women? Why? Because God made us to be very, very, very able to do more than one thing at a time. We are multitaskers. A man, on the other hand, has compartments. He compartmentalizes life because a man has a different role and a different physiology. God's made him that way. From the two comes one. So let's just look at a little bit about this as we look at women keeping the home. Women process life like a plate of pasta. Every noodle is touching another noodle. The noodles intersect a lot of other noodles, just like every thought and issue is connected to every other thought and issue in some way. Girls, is that true? Absolutely. Will your husbands ever understand that? No, don't expect them to. They're not made that way. Well, life is compartmentalized and filled with the issues of problem solving for men, women, do life more as a process. And she's able to interact, intersect, and connect areas at the same time. She's not compartmentalized, but she's a multitask connector, and she will solve problems from a much different perspective. That is why you can put a kid on your hip, you can be talking on the phone, you can be texting, and you can be watching the news on television, cooking dinner, and it's all happening all at the same time. Because God knew we were going to be the keepers of the home, raising the children, keeping them alive, and we were going to have to be able to do many, many things at one time. Jim does not understand how I can read a magazine and watch TV at the same time. He doesn't get that. But I have no problem following the script and also reading an article. Is there anybody else in here like that? Now let's look at a man's, a man. Men process life in boxes, separate holding spaces. They have room for one issue and one only. Typically, men live in one box at a time. They're called compartmentalizing. Men are problem solvers by nature. They enter a box, size up the problem, formulate a solution. Men, is that true? Let me say it again. Men are problem solvers by, nation, by, by nature. They enter a box, size up the problem, and formulate a solution. Sons, is that true? Is that good? All right. In careers, they consider what it will take to be successful and focus on that. In communication, they look for the bottom line and want to get there as quickly as possible. Headlines, not details. Is that true? Decision making, look for an approach that they can buy and apply as often as possible. Yes? All right. A man will strategically organize his boxes and spend the most time in the ones that he can succeed in. 
and men have a nothing box. When you ask your husband what's he thinking and he says nothing, he's in the nothing box. There really is such a place, girls. We have spaghetti, there's no such thing as nothing. We are always thinking, touching, always, 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 always. But men actually have that little place where they go and they, you know, does your man take a nap? My man can take a 10 minute nap. How do they do that? It's like a fight at night. If I, if I have a fight with Jim, you know, I'm still steaming and he's sleeping, he has no problem. It's like, get up and worry a little bit about this relationship. No, he's compartmentalized it. He's in the sleeping box. But my spaghetti is going overtime. It's a wonderful thing how we're made. We're both made in the image of God. And if we understand this about each other, now listen, there may be men that are more spaghetti than waffle, and that's okay. And there may be women that are more waffle than spaghetti. But generally speaking, God has made us differently. Our plumbing's different. Our wiring's different. Our physiology is different. We're women and they're men. And we have a creative role. And a, a, God, a, God has given us a role. So looking at that, looking at how we do life, men want to walk it out and work it out and women want to talk it out. We are the relational piece of this duo. Hello. Is that true? How many men in here want to do Christmas, decorate the house, and throw a party? Mm, where are your hands, sons? Let me see. There's one, Elijah. Yeah, Elijah is a decorator. He's got to watch your furniture in your office because it might end up in Elijah's music room, you know? It's like, oh, where'd you get that? Oh, didn't that come out of you? He's very gifted. This is a general across the board. But having said that, God says, women, you keep the home. So I want to look at just a couple things tonight about what that means to guard and to stand watch, and to oversee the home. Now, it's an amazing thing what God says about men. And I don't have this on the overhead, but I'm going to read it because it's one of my favorite verses. And I don't know if I'm being redundant and you've heard all of this and I'm repeating myself. Pray for me. It could be my age. But let me, we learn by repetition. And in, in Isaiah, get your Bibles out and go to Isaiah chapter 32. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 1 and 2, is, is just a beautiful picture of the sons of God and the Messiah. It says, behold, a king will reign in righteousness. A king will reign in righteousness. And princes will rule with justice. So the king has princes, the sons. Verse 2, a man will be... The word man there is ish, husband, male, individual person. This man will be as a hiding place from the wind and a cover from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. That is a picture of the sons of God. They're strong, they're warriors. God has made them to be a hiding place from the wind for the family. When the storms come, we come under that covering. God has made the sons to be a cover from the tempest. He's made the men to be rivers of water in a dry place when there's nowhere and there's no hope and there's nothing to do. You look to Jesus and then you should look to the son because God, if you've got a husband because that son of God is a son in the house and he's a prince of God and a shadow of a great rock in a weary land. And I can say that my husband has fit that description very well in our lives. But now go to Proverbs chapter 31. Because God, it took really one verse to describe a man. Now let's just take a look at the girls and we're talking about keeping the home. Proverbs chapter 31. I have lived in Proverbs 31 for decades. It's my favorite place to go because I used to hate this chapter and I used to say, God, who could ever be this woman until God said to me, you're reading it wrong. This isn't who you should be. This is who you are. You just have to learn how to become this woman. It's already in you. This is who you are. And it says in Proverbs 31 verse 10, who can find a virtuous wife for her worth is far above rubies. The heart of her husband safely trusts her. He'll have no lack of gain. She does him good and not evil all the days of her life. And then it goes on, and we're going to look at some of these verses tonight and watching over the home, keeping the home. So God says, you're the keeper of the home. He's the head, but you're the heart. You're the keeper. You're the watchman over this home. So three things I want to give you about keeping the homes tonight. 
Girls, you got spaghetti for a reason. You're multitaskers, you're brilliant, you're talented, you're daughters of God, they're sons of God, but you're the daughters. And just like they look like the fathers, so do you. And you have unbelievable capacity and unlimited talent if you can tap into it and believe and walk in faith in this. And this is what God says to do. Three things that he's taught me over 35 years. Keep, I'm gonna look at keeping the home. I'm gonna give you three things to keep. Number one, keep the watch. What does that mean? It means I'm the prayer warrior of our family. This may come as a shock to you, but Jim and I don't pray together very much. As a matter of fact, when I try to pray with Jim, he really doesn't want to pray with me. So if you're trying to get your husbands to pray with you and they don't want to, well, join the party. They pray differently than we do. They, they process differently than we do. And it's okay to pray differently and it's okay not to pray together. But when I started having babies and I was up at two o'clock in the morning missing my sleep, the Holy Spirit said, why don't you take this occasion and learn how to pray over your family? And he turned that nursing hour into the prayer watch. And I began to learn how to pray the word and I began, and he began to teach me how to pray as I would study and I'd hear other teachers and other women that taught me how to pray. And I realized that God had called me to stand watch over my home. That I was a warrior princess as much as my husband was a warrior son of God. And that we have weapons of warfare and that we're mighty through God to the pulling down of every stronghold. And that there's not male and female in the spirit realm. And Satan's just afraid of a woman of God as he is a man of God. And maybe in the physical men are stronger than women, but in the spirit, guess what? Our weapons are the same. And that helmet of salvation, that shield of faith, that sword of the spirit, it's just as powerful in the hand of a woman of faith as it is a hand of a, as the hand of a, a man of faith. And boy, when you get a man and a woman together, both holding up their shields and holding out their swords, there's not a devil in hell or one loose on the earth that can stop the move of God in your family. But I had to stand watch over my family which meant that I had to learn how to pull out my sword. And it wasn't just a bread knife, just once in a while whining and crying to God about my problems, but the Holy Spirit had to teach me how to take out the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, Ephesians chapter six. He's a logos of God, and every word of God is God-breathed and full of power. Every promise of God is pregnant with the ability to bring itself to pass. And as I begin to pray the Word over my children, over my husband, over this church over our finances over every problem we had I begin to see God begin to do things in our lives as I stood watch over our family in prayer Amen. women of God keep the home keep the watch your watchman on the walls of your family when Kim got pregnant God had told me she was pregnant Jim said get behind me Satan you're lying I said I wish I was that's a whole nother testimony. Listen, our kids took us to hell and back. There they all are sitting in that row right now. Righteous and holy and incredible women of God. Anointed by the Holy Spirit. Powerful in their own right. I could not be more blessed or proud of my daughters. But before God got a hold of them and before they could come into their anointing and their calling, the enemy wanted to just sift them like wheat. And it took a woman of God and a mother that would say, oh, hell no. Oh, hell, you are not taking my children. Oh, hell, you are not taking out my church. Oh, gates of hell, you will not prevail against the church of the living God. So women of God, you begin to get up in the middle of the night if you need to and go in a closet and shut the door if you have to because you might get a little bit loud, but you are watchmen on the walls of your home. You are keepers of the home. So women of God, keep the watch over your home. my shield of faith the women of this church have given me these jeweled weapons because I've taught this for 35 years to them women of God when you keep the watch take your shield it's faith that's going to change the situation that's why God says have a sound mind don't fall apart don't cave in to the threats of the enemy 
Don't look at that dragon. That dragon's going to be big and there's giants in front of every promise. But you take the shield of faith when you stand the watch and you begin to believe God like you've never believed him before. And God will not let you down. Keep the watch, women of God. Number, th number two, we're keeping our homes. Keep the order. Sorry. What does that mean, keep the order? Well, let me, you know, when I said keep the watch, I didn't give you a verse. Let me give you Proverbs 31, 18. Sorry, I'm almost done. Are you all right with me? Yes. Proverbs 31, 18 in the Amplified Bible about keeping the watch, prayer warrior for the family. So she raises well it's yet night and gets spiritual food for her household and assigns her maids their task. She tastes and sees that her gain from work with and for God is good. Her lamp goes not out, but it burns on continually through the night of trouble, privation, or sorrow, warning away fear, doubt, and distrust. So there's a verse for you girls. God's called you to stand watch. Keep the order. Let's go to Proverbs 31. Let's look at verse 27 in the Amplified. I believe this is Amplified. It says that this amazing daughter of God keeps an eye on everyone in her household and keeps them all busy and productive. She keeps the order. What does that mean? It means that she's the one that has eyes in the back of her head, on the sides of her head, and she's the one that's anointed by God and created by God. Remember that spaghetti I talked about? She can do more than one thing at a time. She's not compartmentalizing life. She is absolutely zooming around and she's seeing everything that's going on in her family. That's why, girls, for you to think that you, can, you, have, to, you have to just absolutely respect the, the privacy of your children, that's such a crock. As long as they're in your house, they're your children, you better be going through their notes under their beds, checking out their iPhones checking out their technology. You better be snoopers. You better be finding everything that's going out because you are the one that's keeping order in the home. Now your children don't want to hear that. Somebody's got to be willing to be there, not somewhere else. It's hard to be home. It's hard when everybody else is out doing something exciting. It's hard to scrub toilets and to go to the grocery store and do the mundane, everyday things that actually keep a home in order. But there's something supernatural when a husband walks in the doors and the house is clean. And there's order and the kids have got their homework done and there's a meal on the table. There's laundry done. It's not good stuff to do. Nobody likes to do it, but somebody's got to do it. And God says, you do it. You keep the home. You make order in the home. God's a God of order. He's a God of order and structure. And structure is a good thing. You know, when our kids were growing up and they got into high school and we had so many services and golly, we just couldn't meet every night at, at, at the dinner table. So we, we had a rule in our house that we had to have one meal together as a family and it was breakfast. So I'd get up and I worked. I had a full-time job here at the church. But I got up and breakfast was my meal that I cooked. Now, you've heard vicious rumors about me not being able to cook very well. I can tell you with all seriousness before the Lord and all honesty that my children were not scrounging around in dumpsters trying to find food. I cooked. I may not be a good cook, but I was a cook that kept them all alive. And I actually can cook well. I just had a smoke alarm over the oven and so every time things got a little smoky the smoke alarm went off and everybody came down for dinner so it was just misplaced <laughs> keep the order she keeps an eye on everyone in her household and keeps them all busy be willing to be there not somewhere else not on the phone not online not on facebook not somewhere else be there with the children God's anointed us to do this. It's not fun, but it has great reward. Keep the family functioning. Homework, schedules, meals, clothes. The private eye and the sex got us all in one day. We are anointed to be that way. I'm telling you, we're magnificent. 
Women are magnificent. They're magnificent creatures made in the image of God. You can scrub the floors and you can think, oh my gosh, but yeah, that man's going to take one look at you and he's going to get, oh, can I say this? No, I'm not going to say it. The H word. And you're going to go, oh no, forget it. So private eye, cook, sex goddess. There you are, all in one day, and God says, it's good. You've done your job. You may feel like you're not doing anything for God. Oh, yes, you are. You are doing tremendous things for God, because if you don't do it, who's going to do it? Who's going to be there if you're not? Doesn't mean you can't work, and I realize a lot of, a lot of you are single moms in here. Some of you are like my daughter, Kim, and you got to work, and God gives you the grace to do that. But Kim keeps order in her home. She's an amazing young woman. She amazes me. She works full time and then she comes home and she takes care of three kids, three boys. And yet she is sharp on it. She's got eyes in the back of her head. She's checking everything. So keep the watch, keep the order. Proverbs 31, 27, she keeps an eye on everyone in her household and she keeps them all busy and productive. Sometimes you may do the laundry and you're gonna turn your husband's underwear pink, but you've done your job. That was random. <laughs> Can I just tell you a story? Okay, we were having a women's conference and uh, we were in the other building. It was the Teal building. And ah, I was washing Jim's underwear and you know, I'm not gonna tell you what he wears, but they're not kind of like tidy whities Okay, don't tell him this. So, anyway. <laughs> this new red dish towel somehow got in the laundry and it dyed everything the prettiest shade of pink you've ever seen. <laughs> and he had pink tidy whities with a white band all the way around that didn't get dyed. Well, I thought they were beautiful. <laughs> so Friday night, our women's conference had a great guest speaker, the place was packed. You know what he did? He took his tidy whitey that had been dyed pink with a white band. He put it in his coat and he took it out and showed the entire church what I had done. Do you remember that? Anybody remember that here? Keep the order, number three. So keep the watch, keep the order, keep the peace. Girls, if we're gonna keep the home, we gotta keep the peace. What does that mean? It means create an atmosphere of order and beauty. Oh, I love this one, Proverbs 31, 14. And the Message Bible says she's like a trading ship that sails to faraway places and brings back exotic surprises. Dollar store. <laughs> Tuesday morning, big lots, Rosses. Ah, oh, she's like a trading ship that sails to faraway places and brings back exotic surprises. Girls, you are anointed to shop. You are anointed to make a beautiful place for your family. It doesn't take money, but it does take time and it takes somebody that wants to do it. You have the creativity of the Holy Spirit on the inside of you. Sometimes it's just a little tweak here and a little tweak there, light a candle, let the place smell good, cook something wonderful like cookies as they're coming in the door. Making a beautiful atmosphere, a piece of heaven on earth. If we don't do it, I already told you, they're compartmentalized, these men. They're out there, they're, you know, they're the, 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 the river in a, in a dry place, and, and they're the big rock in a weary land, and you know, they're the guys, and they're out there protecting us and doing all the man thing. We, on the other hand, are the women. We are the party girls. We are anointed by God to create an atmosphere of beauty, and goodness in our homes. And it doesn't take money, but it takes a woman who will believe God for it and be willing to take the effort to make her home a place for heaven and a place the kids and the husband want to come home to. Girls, the art of homemaking has been lost. And now we've got all this do-it-yourself projects. You can watch all these design things, and it's a little crazy out there. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about asking the Lord how to make your home beautiful. Maybe it's one room, but it starts with you standing watch, praying over it. It then moves on into you keeping order, and then it begins to blossom as you begin to ask the Holy Spirit, how can I make a beautiful space for my family with scent 
and sound and all the goodness of texture and color and wonderful things, God, that you've given us in this world. It's a beautiful world. Humanity has been made magnificently in the, in the image of God. Art and music, and these things are wonderful. They're not bad. They're beautiful. And why is it that we can't believe God to make beautiful spaces for our families? Sometimes just washing sheets and making a bed can make a beautiful room. Washing the floor and scrubbing the toilet makes it clean so people want to go back in there. Now, nobody's going to appreciate it. You're going to do it, and it's going to get dirty, and in five minutes, you're going to have to do it again. That's why you've got to stay and be there, keeping the order. But God says, girls, you're the piece of heaven on the earth that I've given the man to create an atmosphere of peace, order, and beauty. She's like a trading ship that sails to faraway places and brings back exotic surprises. You're anointed to shop. Bottom line, you're anointed to shop. I just can't get away from it. It's just, it's a tough thing to say, but girls, you're anointed to shop. <laughs> in Proverbs 31, 17 and 19, it says, first thing in the morning, she dresses for work. See, she's got a job. She's actually a businesswoman. She rolls up her sleeves, eager to get started. She senses the worth of her work, is in no hurry to call it quits for the day. She's skilled in the crafts of home and hearth, diligent, in homemaking. You have the God-given gift to make heaven on earth in your homes. So just some things that we've done over the years to keep the peace and make a beautiful place for our family. We have made the family table holy. Like I said, we had to pick one meal where we could all be together. And whether my kids liked breakfast or not, they showed up at the table. It's amazing what happens when you turn the instruments off, the technology off, and you come around a table to eat together, whether it's breakfast or lunch or dinner, okay? It's a holy table. We made the family table holy. We turned off their phones. You know, we, we live in a world that is constantly interrupted. People are texting now and they're not talking. Have you noticed that? And have you noticed that when a phone rings, that it says you could be in a conversation, but instantly you talk on the phone. I grew up in the age where there weren't phones, and you turned the phone off when we came home from work, from the church. Jim turned the phone off. He would not allow that phone to ring when it was family time, because family time was sacred, as the head of the house. We need to turn these phones off. We need to turn the computers off, turn the music off, and we need to talk to each other and communicate as a family. It's healthy for us. And girls, you're going to be the one that instigates it. Your husband's not the one that's anointed to do that. You are. So here's some other ideas. Make your own family traditions. What does that mean? If you don't have some that were passed down, then make your own. What does that mean? It means Thanksgiving, Christmas, birthdays. We made a big deal out of things. My husband's Italian. He's really a Nucci. He's really not a cobra, that's a false name, but that's too long of a story to tell. <laughs> Debbie Nucci, <laughs> it's got a nice ring to it. I'm Swedish, I'm a little Swedish girl. Okay, so I grew up with Thanksgiving and we had certain things, you know, hot cross buns at Easter, my mom had traditions in the family and so did my husband. And so we have spaghetti now with every turkey meal. We have spaghetti at Thanksgiving, we have spaghetti at Christmas, we have spaghetti at Easter, we have spaghetti all the time, but it's a family tradition. And the kids are convinced that it's wonderful and they do it. And my green bean casserole, they hated my green bean casserole. They would not eat my green bean casserole, but my green bean casserole is mushroom soup with a brick of cream cheese. It changes everything. Anyway, now I can't have Thanksgiving or Christmas without green bean casserole because my kids have to have it. They wouldn't eat it, but now it's a tradition. So girls, three cans of green beans, one brick of cream cheese, and one thing of mushroom soup. It'll change your life. All right. <laughs> Last one. Celebrate life. Make birthdays and victories special. Life is too short not to celebrate. Birthdays are important. It doesn't take money to celebrate a birthday. But a song, we sing special person song, have a red plate. 
special things. Make your traditions. The husband is commanded by God to leave his father and his mother and cleave to his wife. She's commanded by God to come under the authority and let him be the head of the house and submit to him and reverence him. And here's this beautiful woman of God, this amazing picture of a woman made in the image of God. And God says, now you keep the home. You're the heart. Keep the watch, girls. Pray about everything, worry about nothing. Keep the order, because if you don't, nobody will. You're anointed to do it. And the last one about keeping. Keep the peace. Make your place a place that they want to come home to. A place of beauty and a place of goodness. It doesn't take a lot. It takes a happy heart full of faith that can believe God that her family is going to grow and change the world. You know, the last verse in Proverbs chapter 31, and I'll close with this. I don't even think I've got it up on the overhead. It says in verse 28, her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. For charm is deceitful and beauty is passing, it's vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. See, when you live a life for God, when you're willing to submit your heart to God's word when it's breaking, when you're willing to do the hard things that you don't want to do, the boring things, the everyday mundane things, when you're willing to believe that the smallest insignificant things mean a great deal to God. There'll be a day when you'll pass on a legacy of righteousness and holiness. And those kids that you didn't think will ever serve God, they'll be serving God stronger and better than you ever believed. You'll be leaving a legacy of a good name and righteousness. You'll be changing generational curses. You'll have prayed through so many wars that you got notches on your faith belt. And you understand how to pray and how the Word of God works. And when you close your eyes and you get to go home, you will leave a legacy of a godly woman who feared God. And that is the best thing, girls, that you could ever leave in your life. Because one day, you're going to stand before God. And He's going to look at you and He's going to say, what did you do with your life? And your life's going to pass by. You're going to see it. Let's don't forsake our homes. Let's don't forsake our children or our husbands. Let's believe God again. Let's be women, magnificent, beautiful women that he's made in his image, loving our families to life, keeping watch, keeping everybody focused, and keeping the peace in our homes. Because the last commandment is women. You are the keeper of your home. Now keep it. So four things. Submit to your own husband as unto the Lord. Let him be head of the house, commandment two. Reverence him. Reverence is a powerful thing. And keep the home. You're the one anointed to be the heartbeat of heaven in that house. Yeah. yeah. That was good. We're magnificently made in the image of God. And not everybody in here may know that. But everything and everybody in here, one thing for sure is going to happen to all of us and we're going to die. Death is certain for each and every one of us. We are going to die. And when we die, what then? Some people don't believe that there's a hell or there's an afterlife. Well, how convenient, but just because you don't believe it doesn't mean it's true. There was a world that didn't believe that the world was round and they thought you were going to fall off the ocean. We didn't believe in microwaves because we couldn't see them, but just because you can't see something doesn't mean it's not real. And Jesus talked about hell and he talked about death and he says it's appointed once for man to die and then judgment. So what are you doing with the rest of your life? If you were to die tonight and walk out those doors, would you know where you're going? 
Would you know that you're going to heaven for sure? Or do you think you might be ending up in hell? And most of you have been here and say, oh, no, I don't, I'm not going to hell, but how do you know? If you don't have an assurance of heaven, then why would you be allowed into God's heaven? You know, we live in a world where there's many things and many philosophies, and we're taught that many roads lead to heaven, but God never said that. He didn't say all roads lead to heaven. He said there's one way and one way only. It's through his son, Jesus Christ. That's why the son came. That's why Jesus walked through the earth experience and fused himself with humanity and became the God-man. That's why he was the only one qualified to take on the sin of this world. You and I were born into it. There's nothing we can do about it. There was no way we could get to God. There was no possible way. All our good works, all of our human effort, everything that we ever tried to do to get to God it wouldn't work because God says your goodness is like a filthy rag to me. God knew that we couldn't get to him, so he came to us. So my question before we close tonight is what have you done with the Savior? Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. And he said, there's only one way to God. It's through me. And he said, you must be born again. What does that mean? He very, very simply explained it to Nicodemus one Jerusalem night. And he said, Nicodemus, who was a rabbi in Jerusalem, he said, Nicodemus, when Nicodemus came and said, how do I get to heaven? Jesus said, Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. And Nicodemus very honestly said to Jesus as an old man, he says, I'm old. How can I get into my mother's womb? And Jesus said, you don't get it. What is born of the spirit is spirit. And what is born of the flesh is flesh. You're a fleshly body, but you're a spirit. God's a spirit. You're a spirit. Your spirit, your eternal part, this body's going to fall off into the dust, but your spirit is going to live forever. And that spirit has been disconnected by sin. And he says, there's only one way back to God. Your spirit must be born again. And this is how, Nicodemus, I'm going to a cross. No one's going to take my life from me. I'm going to lay it down and I'm going to pick it up again, Nicodemus. And if you'll look at that cross and believe, Believe that I am the Son of God, the Messiah, the one that came, the only one that can take away the sin of this world. If you'll believe that, Nicodemus, you'll be born again as you surrender your life to me and let me be Savior and Lord. There's a lot of people that say they're Christians in America. God didn't say just because you say you're a Christian makes you one. God said those that surrender their hearts and their lives to him and let him be Savior and Lord. That means boss. America is a very, very, very interesting place. We don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. We want to be politically correct. But you see, God doesn't worry about hurt feelings or being politically correct. God says, you're either born again or you're not. You're either trusting in Jesus or you have refused the Son. My question to you is, what have you done with the Son? Have you looked at that cross? Have you settled the issue in your heart? Have you become born again by surrendering your life to him and he is your savior and your Lord? And if you have not done that, you're here tonight by divine appointment to change destinies and to say yes to Jesus tonight. So I'm gonna give you an opportunity all over this auditorium and by, by, by streaming and by internet. If you're watching tonight, you've never made Jesus Christ your savior and your Lord. Savior, you, you have to have one, you can't get to God. Lord means boss. If you've never done that, then tonight is your night. How do I do it? It's very simple. You surrender your heart and your life to him. Yes, we'll pray a prayer with you. Yes, in a moment I'll ask you to raise your hand and get right with God. But it's not the words of the prayer. It's the heart that says, I believe you are God and I know I need a savior and here I am, all of me, good and bad. God's not angry with you. He's not in shock over your sin. You cannot keep yourself right, but he can change you. So all over this auditorium, if you've been running from God instead of to God, I'm talking to you. If you've never surrendered your heart and your life to him, I'm talking to you. If you're a good person, better than I'll ever dream of being, but you've not said yes to Jesus Christ, I am talking to you. I'm just going to count to three and I'm just going to ask you to raise your hand all together at the same time. Eyes up, heads up. You know why? Because if you could say it in front of a crowd, you can walk out those doors and live for him. Are you ready? All over this auditorium. You've been running from him instead of to him. Let's get right with God tonight. 
Everything we've preached, everything we've talked about, none of it works until you get right with God and you get a new spirit. You ready? One, two, three. Just raise your hands high. I see that hand. 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 I see that hand in the family room. I see that hand. I see that hand. Jim and I came out of sin. We came out of ridiculous living, wrong choices. And here we are today, 35 years later, telling you this is real. God isn't going to take your fun away. God's going to actually teach you how to be a son and a daughter of God. And that's when the fun begins. But he says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. But if you deny me, I'll deny you. Christianity is not for cowards, but it is for those that want to surrender their lives and get right with God. So I've seen about seven hands go up. There's probably about at least 10 of you in here. This isn't a big night, but I know there's 10 of you in here. So what we're going to do, we're going to stand up. And if you raised your hand, now it's time for you to take everything that you brought to church with you. Grab it and come and meet me in this altar. And we're going to get right with God. If you didn't raise your hand, it is not too late as we come forward. So come quickly, let's get right with God. Won't you come just as you are? Come quickly out of the family room. If you raise your hand, get your kids and come. Husbands, wives. Let's get right. Let's do this once and for all. You can't change you, but God can. Well, here you are. Look at you. What a beautiful family. Smile at me because you're not going to a funeral. You're going to a birthday party. It's yours. And God's going to absolutely set you free, make you his own, a daughter, a son. This is Pastor Joel. We're going to ask you to go with him so that we can privately pray with you and hand you some material that my husband wrote and just talk to you for a little bit. Your families can join you in the all in the in this special room that we're going to take you to. I'm about as weird as it gets. My husband just shook his head as I'm giving out the recipe for green bean casserole. But you know what? We can actually have fun. God's awesome. He made us. He is not uptight, and he's not mad at you. Is there any? I know there's more of you in here. You little rebellious children. You need to get your little butts down here. Just sing it one more time. I can feel you. Who are you that we're stopping this service and you need to come? You need to get right. Your heart's pounding. You wish I'd shut up. I'm not going to. I'm going to keep us another two minutes. Can you believe it? Just for you. Elijah, sing it one more time. Please come. I can't make you come, but I can only say you'll never be sorry. Never will you ever regret letting Jesus be Savior and Lord of your life. It's the only way you can become a real man and a real woman. There's no other way. He'll give you life everlasting. Christians, just pray He'll for He'll give you strength for today. Just taste the living the devil's water. such a liar. And you'll never thirst again. Okay. We'll come back. Don't stop. Just because you didn't come forward tonight doesn't mean you won't. This is Pastor Joel. If you make a left turn, he's going to lead you. And we'll meet you in the altar workers room. We're going to pray with you. Welcome to your destiny. Hey, you just heard that altar call. You just wanted to give God all of your heart and all of your life. Now let me lead you simply in a prayer of inviting Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior. In fact, why don't you just go ahead and listen to me and go ahead and close your eyes and just repeat these words after me. I'll go slow. You repeat them. Say these words. Say, Father God, 
I come to you in the name of Jesus. I believe that Jesus Christ is your only begotten Son and that you sent him for me and that he died for me on that cross at Calvary. I believe that his blood washes away my sins, that I am now a new creature in Christ Jesus. And I thank you, Lord. I receive you now and forever as my Lord and as my Savior. I'm going to turn from sin, and I'm going to turn with all of my heart and all of my life to you, Jesus, as my Lord and as my Savior. Let it be known in heaven as well as upon the earth that I am born again. I'm a child of God, that I'm saved, and I'm headed for heaven and denying my presence in hell. Thank you, Jesus. I'm alive forevermore. Love you so much. God bless you guys. Everybody just say amen and receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So talk to you later. God bless you. Bye-bye.